Good afternoon. My name is Nicole Contardo, Marketing Director for McKesson and your host for today's webinar. I want to take a minute to share a little bit more about McKesson before we get started. As America's oldest and largest healthcare services company, McKesson has been focusing on healthcare for 180 years. Today, McKesson is ranked 14th on Fortune's list of the nation's largest companies, with over $122 billion in annual revenues. We employ more than 37,000 people throughout North America, Europe, and Asia. We distribute pharmaceuticals and medical supplies to retail pharmacies, hospitals, and health systems. And we provide software, automation, services, and consulting to hospitals, physicians' offices, imaging centers, home health care agencies, and payers. McKesson Business Performance Services is an experienced provider of health care management, medical billing, and technology services for hospitals, health systems, physicians, and other valued stakeholders nationwide. We offer a comprehensive portfolio of revenue cycle solutions, practice management services, and advanced technology to help our clients achieve better business health. Understanding the importance of ICD-10, McKesson BPS is working diligently to ensure your transition to ICD-10 is smooth. In addition to today's webinar, we have developed a series of specialty-specific webinars for ICD-10 that will be emailed out at the conclusion of this call. If you would like to find out more about how we can help your transition process, contact us following the webinar. Before I introduce today's speakers, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. In order to minimize audio interference, we have muted all attendees on today's call. We'll be taking questions at the conclusion of the presentation. If you have any questions, please submit them through the GoToMeeting questions feature to the meeting host. The questions feature is located on the right of the screen. If we run out of time to answer all the questions, we will follow up with any open questions via email after the call. If you do think of anything you forgot to ask after the meeting, email us after the call. Additionally, we'll be taking polling questions throughout the webinar and encourage you to participate in the polls. The answers to each question will help us shape future educational sessions. I'm happy to have you all on our call. ICD-10 for anesthesia, pain management, orthopedics, general surgery, neurology, neurosurgery, critical care, and cardiology. Speaking on today's webinar, we have Cindy Kane, Senior Director of Physician Services, and Joe Fisher, Coding Compliance Consultant. With that, I will introduce Cindy Kane. Thank you, Nicole. Um, one of the things uh, for many of you are our attendees, you'll notice that on our agenda, we um, have some of the things that are still to compare our ICD-9 CM to ICD-10 CM, the structuring format, some of our conventions, uh, system specific details. We'll go over some case examples again and some of our reminders and tips. So in each webinar, a few of the slides reviewed are going to be on key differences, format, and structure. So for you that have attended before, this would actually be just a refresher at a high level. And then for you that may be attending for the first time, we wanted to offer that same information. So if we go to our slide, what's the big deal between our ICD-9-CM versus ICD-10-CM? We basically have 15 months until October 2014. So, you know, for myself, you know, 15 months may sound, you know, 15 months. But if you are in the physician's office, the hospital, the consultant role, we know how quickly with the changes and with our daily tasks and what we have to do. So, you know, that is one of the purposes at a high level for our educational seminars. On our next slide, when we're looking at the ICD-9-CM and the ICD-10 key differences, you'll notice over under the ICD-9, Volume 1 and 2, you can actually see that we have 13,000 diagnosis codes. We're all accustomed to the three to five digit and actually the code format. When we go to ICD-10-CM, again, 68,000 diagnosis codes three to seven digits, but then the format changes because we go into the alpha is always the first digit, and then digit two through seven are numeric. So we can see, you know, just a substantial difference of, you know, what we have to learn and also assist in training. But, you know, one of our um, things to remember with this is the structure format and the volume difference. And keep in mind that in your ICD-9, CM is volume three. And then ICD-10, your CM, your PCS, those will be your hospital-based only. 
On the next slide, when we're talking about ICD-10, the CM changes, one of the things that we'll see, we've listed, you know, here are some of the, the details of that. But you'll notice under the changes, it is the combination codes. Uh, this will include your conditions, associated symptoms, manifestations. If you're on the West Coast market, and you do a lot with HCC coding and RAF scores, you understand the importance of manifestation coding as well. There'll be combination codes for poisoning, external causes. And then we talk about you know, pressure ulcers. And then we'll actually be discussing this a little bit more when we get into the anesthesiology portion. On our next slide, when we look at limitation of GEMS, many questions that I'm asked by physicians and staff, is there a one-for-one -one crosswalk? And if you look here at the example, there is not the one-for-one. -one. You know, there, we do have the crosswalk. That is a great starting uh, portion. But one of the things, you know, is to keep in mind is, you know, how prepared do you feel that your organization you know, as we, we look at the things within the gym, and if you're looking at your top diagnosis codes, you know, remember about the limitations. And I've recommended, you know, that you would start to look at your top 25, or if you want to be adventurous, look at 50, but what are your most common codes? And then start to look at what your I-10 codes will be and what that impact will be. Uh, we now will have a, uh, a polling question. So please, you know, participate in the polling question because this does help us. And if we move, uh, continuing with our presentation, you know, what is the big deal? So we talk about structure, we talk about format. And if we look at you know, the index on our next slide under the CMS to ICD-10, when you're currently trying to find information about a specific condition, a disease, a sign, or symptom, or any other clue you know, that would help us find a particular code. So when you're looking at you know, the index, the benefits of ICD-10 is greater detail, being more specific, the terminology, disease classification, having consistency, You'll have classification that the system provides with more detailed data. So it does allow, you know, for, for coders when they're looking at that, knowing that the detail they need to go, you know, to. So this kind of walks you through, you know, when you are looking at the index. If most of you have already purchased your ICD-10, your draft book, you've probably started to go through that and you can look at that. On the next slide, when we're talking about signs and symptoms, you know, when to use a sign or symptom, it's no different from ICD-9. The conditions that are not a part of the disease may be listed separately in addition to a definite diagnosis from another condition. So the disease or problem that is identified, you know, this is where it's allowing you to look for that within your signs and symptoms. The conditions that become an integral part of the disease process, you know, should not be identified separately. So again, your signs and symptoms, you know, very much with how you're looking at that today, but knowing, you know, that you will be able to take it to that next level. On the next slide, when we look at the structural difference in ICD-10-CM, you'll notice, you know, again, in the sense organs within the eyes and the ears, those are now separate where it used to be within the nervous system. So now they have their own chapter within ICD-10-CM. In the ICD-9, our you know, V and E codes, those are going to be incorporated into the main classifications when you look into the ICD-10-CM list. And then with injuries, you know, they're grouped first. You have your SOT, and then it will go by your top, and then it would be, you know, what is that type of fracture if it's an open wound. And that is, you know, a little bit separate versus how we would have looked at injuries in ICD-9 CEM. So we will have some examples of that to show you. The next slide, when we talk about the structural differences, We've, um, you know, went over this, you know, in previous uh, presentations, but it's important when you're looking at your top codes that to realize that ICD-10, the CM, will utilize a placeholder, and with that, it will be the character X. And that will actually be that it can allow for the future expansion. Some examples, if you look in the poisoning under the T categories, 
And then when you have a placeholder where it exists, the X must be used for it to be a valid code. If you're not incorporating the X within those codes, then that claim would be denied. On the next slide, when we actually show you an example here, uh, this would be if we're looking at the example S is our numeric, then we have 52.502 and then A. And this would be the code for an unspecified fracture, lower end of the weft radius. It's the initial encounter for a closed fracture. So you can see in the example, um, and this is a, a good slide for a teaching purposes and to show physicians because it's always a capital, the first letter, then you have numeric, you have numeric. Then you can see when we get to the fourth, it could actually be alpha or numeric, and then you may have the extension. So this actually shows, you know, kind of at that snapshot what that structural difference will be. On the next slide, if we look at ICD-10-CM and what is the difference from ICD-9-CM, you can see that under ICD-10, the code for unspecified part of the right clavicle, the initial encounter for a closed fracture, you can see, you know, again, our code and how it goes with the numeric, alphanumeric, and how the extension is working. If you were using just your I9, the code that would be for fracture, clavicle, and specified closed, you can see the difference not only in the code, but you can see that now you had to incorporate the initial encounter for that visit. So that does go back to the documentation and how physicians may be documenting today is that if you look at your top codes that you choose to select and you see how the physicians are documenting, you may go ahead and be able to say, you know, we're not now documenting certain verbiage that will now become a part of the code. Additional details with the ICD-10-CM on the code and what's provided is, you know, it's lateral, it's the right clavicle, the extension is the initial encounter. The next slide, when we talk about conventions of ICD-10-CM, a couple of things, and then we continue to our next slide, we talk about the excludes notes. And under ICD-10, the excludes one, you will have codes that will be considered a top one excludes. That means it's not coded here. And then you're going to have some of the ICD-10 exclude one examples. So if you look over to the right side, you can see where we're showing where there's some of the examples that fall under the excludes. But under ICD-10, there are two types of excludes notes. Each type will have a different definition for use. They are all similar in which they indicate that code is excluded from each other or either may be independent of each other. So again, it goes back to the documentation for that visit. So as you're reviewing your top codes, you want to make the determination of which of those codes may be impacted with either excludes one or excludes two or both. On the next slide, when we're looking at an example of excludes two, you can see here that this is a top two excludes note represents not included here. So this indicates that the condition excluded is not part of the condition represented by the code, but yet a patient may have both conditions at the same time. And in this case, both codes may be assigned together. So you may have the patient that presents with acute tonsillitis and excludes two code you would see would be chronic tonsillitis. So again, you know, you do have the difference between excludes one, excludes two. Um, you know, again, there is, you know, I'm finding in working with some of the providers, there is a little bit of confusion in this area. So again, it does go back for the training perspective, from the coders to look at the top codes, and then to find out, you know, of the most commonly used codes, do they fall into the categories, and do you use both the codes, or when do you not use both the codes? Um, and we will, in some of our future presentations, go into other examples based on the specialty in the excludes one and the excludes two. On the next slide, when we say not so different, basically when you're looking in the verbiage, currently and means the and or or, with will still mean associated with or due to. You may have, you know, your NEC and NOS are used the same. Coding conventions for your use of and other 
those you know will be unchanged. So basically, in the code convention for your excludes notes and exclusion terms, those parts of that will stay unchanged. So that is a little bit of what is not so different. And then we say, you know, well, what is the big deal about anatomy and physiology? If we look at the next slide, and this just actually gives an example if we were going to study anatomy, refresher courses, you know, are highly recommended only due to the complexity and the specifics of ICD-10 coding so that, you know, if you have if you are the certified coder and you work in a multi-specialty office and you may see you know, combinations of different types of patients, different diagnosis codes, you know, again, a refresher course going over that. If you primarily work with cardiology, orthopedic, you know, your areas, again, you will find that there are some greater detail in that. So you know, uh, just a quick refresher course is you know, highly recommended. When we go to the next slide and we talk about some of the system-specific uh, digestive, when you look at the next slide, this actually, if you have your book and you're looking at Chapter 11, this actually is the diseases of the digestive system, which start with your K00 and go through the K94. You'll see that there is greater detail of how they're broken out into the different categories. So again, it allows you to say, you know, based on your job responsibilities or what you're responsible for, you know, what are the chapters, what are the areas that you want to maybe start to look and see what those, you know, changes will be. On the next slide, some of the changes that will fall in the category you'll notice with, you know, the gastric, ulcer, posts have been eliminated that have, you know, that description where it used to say with obstruction. You'll notice under uh, the liver disease, there are some combination cuts there. You'll notice under the pancreas codes, there's types of pathology. And so there's a new section that will actually be in this area, this chapter 11, that will also be if you're having types of complications under artificial openings. So depending on procedures, surgeries, again, you know, these are new, where in the past you may not have had codes for that documentation, and now you will. On the next slide, we did put some of the combination codes that are strictly just with the polyps of the colon. So you can see, again, you know, we have all the inflammatory, but it now actually breaks that down into uh, our six different categories here. So again, you know, if you're working within, you know, the gastro, general surgery, and the physician's you know, documentation is very detailed, you're going to see now that there's so many other options to select from. So again, you know, the detail back to the documentation. On our next slide, when we talk about our neoplasms, and then we go to our next slide, this is actually in chapter two. And you can see if you're looking through this chapter, it starts you know, with COO, but due to the magnitude, it goes all the way like E49, the options of where the neoplasms will be. On our next slide where we listed and we're trying to show you know, some of the changes, you'll notice when we have our table that some of the neoplasms will now be in their own category if they're not you know, part of the malignancy. The code descriptions, some of that has changed. So without mention of remission for multiple myelomas, malignant, plasm, cell neoplasms, leukemia changes. These have expanded to not having uh, the verbiage you would see to achieved remission, in remission, or in relapse. So from the uh, looking at the high volume, you know, even if you're seeing a patient for a different disease, but the cancer is still part of their active, you know, diseases that they have, and those are things that are being looked at, being documented, you now have to look at and say, you know, has the patient achieved remission? What is that code? Are they just currently in remission? Or are they now in a relapse? So, you know, this actually plays, you know, very much in to most any specialty. If, you know, you're seeing the patient for one certain illness or disease, but yet also, you know, they're having to follow up due to where they may be, you know, with the current uh, cancer that they have. Our next uh, slide actually shows our neoplasm table. This is strictly a reference guide. Uh, if you deal with neoplasms, again, this may be something that you want to look at. You can see where it shows the primary, the secondary, 
if things are unspecified, if it's benign. So this is actually you know, strictly a reference guide showing the, the neoplasm table and how some of the changes have occurred. On our next slide, when we're talking about coding neoplasms, you know, one of the things, the guideline for coding, is to go back and you can reference the neoplasm table. And this is actually you know, in the alphabetic index. And then you want to look at, in the history, you know, what has been documented, what terms should be referenced if you're looking at the index. And then this will allow you to determine you know, what would be the appropriate column, what would be the appropriate code. You know, many times we don't have typology reports back. You know, we're looking at you know where do we where do we go with the code? But you know, basically, your neoplasms are divided into the five behavior groups. It's malignant, it's um, benign, it's a carcinoma in a site, it's uncertain behavior or unspecified nature. So again, you know, very critical when we're looking at you know coding the neoplasm that we're being very specific and that it is, you know, based on the documentation. On our next slide, to just show an example, if we were looking at uh, currently carcinoma, it's in the breast, uh, we see that we would have code 233.0. Now look over to the right, and you can see now what code would you select. So, you know, if this is something in the specialty that you see on a daily basis and that you are doing the coding, you know, is the physician or the group of physicians, how would their documentation change? So you can definitely see that if, you know, I as a coder, if I'm looking at this, you know, it's going to take me that few extra minutes to look through, go back and verify, and then say, okay, exactly where am I going now, what code am I going to select? So, you know, for me personally in looking at this, you know, I said, my goodness, you know, let me go through and say, I, I before would have memorized the code, 233.0. Now I'm going to have to really make sure that, you know, the physicians I'm working with, they understand this and the magnitude because that selection of just this one code, you know, the magnitude that it has changed. On our next slide, we, we go into cardiology, you know, the, what are we going to see in some of the changes in cardiology. So on the next slide, you know, ICD-10, it will make documentation and coding for cardiology more efficient. So with that, you're going to have the areas of angina, chest pain, coronary artery disease, acute MI, if it's atrial fib, congestive heart failure, if there's a microvalve disorder, aortic valve disorder, valve. So you're going to be able to see that, you know, that it will make, if you work in cardiology, it will be a little more efficient. On our next slide, it's just some of the common terminologies for cardiology. Again, you know, aneurysm, angioplasty, um, the thallium stress test. There's multitudes of, you know, the terms, but these are some of the most common terms that, you know, you may see within the cardiology. On our next slide, we gave an example. Uh, you know, we've had feedback that everyone, you know, the examples seem to help as we're looking, um, you know, to say, where are we going to change? What will that magnitude be? This is actually, we can see under this one, it's a coronary artery disease with angina. So under, you know, when we're looking at ICD-10 and the patient would present with a known CAD and current angina, one code will cover it. So you will have the combination code will come in several varieties, depending on whether you document unstable angina or just plain angina. So this is an example of showing the unstable angina example. So, you know, you can see where we have our code, what codes it is replacing, and again, to where it does allow a little bit more um, being in the example specific, but also a little bit easier to code because it does break it down into the different categories. Our next slide shows an acute MI. And ICD-10 has adopted a new definition for acute MI. And this actually came from the World Health Organization. And they shortened the acute phase of an MI from eight weeks to four weeks. So for cardiologists, you know, no doubt, you know, this change was made to better reflect the efficiency of current methods of treating our heart attack patients. So again, with it being updated, with the new definition, you know, with our codes, 
it does, you know, assist in trying to define and say, with the changes, here will now be, you know, a better way that we will be able to code, but also, again, you know, in treating our patients, how some of that verbiage has changed. The next slide is actually the example. So we're showing you, you know, the ICD-10. We're showing you how that code is replaced from ICD-9. And in ICD-10, you know, when we're using the word uh, subsequent in an acute MI code, it takes on a different meaning. So, you know, all in all, the conditions that are central to the practice of cardiology are more straightforward to the code, and the codes are better reflected under a current clinical understanding in the clinical environment. There is a tricky part, you know, if there is one, but it's to remember that when you're doing your follow-up codes, you know, you have to look at it and say if a patient is coming in for an acute MI, it's going to refer to is it new, is that acute MI within four weeks of a previous MI. So again, we're going back to, you know, very detailed documentation. You know, this can be for the clinical staff, if they're the ones, you know, that is um, the patient, especially if you're on an electronic health record with many offices, the clinical staff is involved, if they're coming in very, you know, important in the cardiology world to keep, you know, the dates and to know when the patient was in the last time, what are the lab results. So, you know, through the training and as you're thinking in your offices of where training needs to occur in certain situations and who may be obtaining the information, it's not only the physician, you know, but how the clinical staff will be involved as well. And then we will show, you know, another case example. And we're going to stop uh, for another poll question. So please look um, at the poll question and participate in that, please. And if we go to our, our case example, and we're continuing with cardiology, so this actually shows under this example, number one, the highlighted documentation and how it will increase the specificity required for ICD-10. So our example is, you know, with our 79-year-old man, he's been in the physician's office for a follow-up visit, but six months earlier, he had had a cerebral vascular accident, a CVA, and was hospitalized. So if you go through, we look at this example in cardiology, you know, this is, you know, kind of a top, you know, probably five or ten type case example. But he's had, you know, some issues. He's improving with patient, uh, outpatient physical therapy. He's also being treated because he has benign hypertension, an atrial flutter. He's on prescription medications, and these were renewed, and the patient is told, you know, with a follow-up in six months. If we look at our next slide and we see to where we have in column over to the left-hand side, it shows our ICD-9 coding on, on this particular slide. So you can see that we would have had our 438.20 about the CVA on the dominant side. We would have had the, um, the 438.82. We would have had our hypertension, our atrial flutter. In our column that's in the central, we go back and we say, here's ICD-10 coding without the highlighted documentation. So you can see where we had our four codes before, we still have pretty much our four codes. But if we then go and see where the documentation is highlighted, because this is where it's very detailed, this is where the physician is saying, here's exactly what occurred, this was the time frame, here is now the treatment. You can see where the codes do change with the highlighted documentation. So again, as coders, we do code what is documented. But you can see where the codes do change. You can see with the highlighted documentation that if this is being recorded in the note from the physician, you can see that we do have a change in our first code and how that will change. So again, you know, the importance of saying, you know, today, what would my examples look like versus when I do move into the ICD-10.
And I'm going, in our next slide, we're going to be talking some about anesthesiology. So at this uh, time in the presentation, I'm going to turn it over to Joe Fisher, and he's going to go over uh, some of our next slides. Great. Thank you very much, Cindy. <clears throat> Excuse me. With the imp implementation of I-10, I believe it's going to have a bigger impact on anesthesia coders because depending on their practice, they could be utilizing every chapter in the ICD-10 coding manual. As you see on the first statement here on slide 45, we can't stress this enough. Providers' documentation for ICD-10 will need to be more specific and detailed than is required for ICD-9. Now, this may mean capturing new information about the patient's condition that the anesthesia provider never before documented, or updating, modifying, and expanding his or her documentation. A good example that I currently see is the documentation of pressure ulcers, which Cindy alluded to earlier in the presentation. Currently, it's not too often that we see the stage of the pressure ulcer documented in the anesthesia record. However, now with ICD-10, a single code is going to include both the location and the stage of a pressure ulcer. So providers who currently have good documentation habits will find the transition to I-10 much easier than those providers who use abbreviations or other shortcuts. The ICD-10 codes will have a longer code structure they're going to include laterality. They're going to use combination codes. And they will specify the types of encounters. However, the one thing that remains consistent is that no code is considered valid or complete unless it's coded to the highest level of specificity in its category. If you take a look at the muscular skeletal systems diagnosis codes, they're going to show the complexity and details that an anesthesia provider will need to document. To code a fracture in ICD-10, there needs to be documentation of the anatomic site on the bone, be it proximal, shaft, or distal. Also include the laterality. Also the fracture type, which would be displaced non-displaced, open, or closed. And if it is an open fracture, there's three more subsets to choose from based on the Gastillo open fracture classification and also documentation of the episode of care. So you'll notice on slide 47, we have an example of a radius shaft fracture. In ICD-9 right now, we would code it with an 813.21 without additional information. And in I-10, we need to know the laterality, the fracture type, and the episode of care. Currently, with just the documentation of radius shaft fracture, there's 270, 270 ICD-10 codes to choose from. For this example, we're going to choose the right side closed and non-displaced transverse type fracture with an initial episode of care. <clears throat> with that documentation, the code would be S52.324A. We start to build the code with the fracture radius shaft being S52.3. The additional documentation of transverse fracture gives us the fifth digit of two. Additional documentation of non-displaced and right radius gives us the sixth digit of four. And then the seventh digit of A corresponds to the additional documentation of initial encounter for closed fracture. Every bit of this information will need to be documented in order to code it appropriately. Continuing on slide 48. In ICD-10, there will still be a few not otherwise specified codes. However, this should signal a red flag and direct the provider to document any additional information that may be applicable to get to a more specific code. This may mean querying the surgeon for any additional information. The second example here is commonly seen on the anesthesia record is simply fractured tibia. <clears throat> 
Sometimes they will include left tibia or right tibia. In ICD right now, we can code the documentation of fractured tibia as A23.80. In ICD-10, if the reality was that it was a right side, closed, displaced, oblique-type fracture, proximal tibia, and was the initial encounter, we would code it as S82.121A. And we would build it starting with the fracture of the lateral condyle of the tibia, which is S82.12. Additional documentation of it being displaced, and on the right tibia gives us the sixth digit of 1, and the seventh digit of A corresponds to the additional documentation of it being the initial encounter for a closed fracture. So again, you see how important it is to have all this specific detail documented in order to get to the appropriate code. On the next slide, we have pain management. Specifically on slide 50, chronic pain, not elsewhere classified, is coded to subcategory G89.2. And it also requires a fifth digit, depending if it's documented as being due to trauma, post-thoracotomy, or post-procedural. Also, there is a difference, or there, I should say there's a coding difference between central pain syndrome chronic pain syndrome and documentation of chronic pain. And it should only be coded when the provider has specifically documented these conditions. As with I-9, there is no time frame defining when pain becomes chronic pain, and the provider's documentation should be used to guide use of these codes. One example of the changes specific to pain management includes non-remitting back aches. So it's important to document right or left side when reporting sciatica or lumbago with sciatica. So again, we're looking for that documentation specifying the, which side the pain is on. At this point, I'm going to hand it back to Cindy. Okay, thank you, Joe. <clears throat> and, you know, to, to add to what Joe was talking about, you know, we have showed some of the case examples where we're highlighting um, the specificity within a physician's note and how that does change. But also with Joe's slides, you know, going back over how you build the code, you know, again, based on the documentation, because as a coder, you know, we cannot make the assumption, you know, we can co only code what is documented. And <clears throat> as Joe had spoken about, and as you've seen if you're looking in your IPN book, you will see there are still unspecified codes. But one of the things that we want to keep in mind, and one of the things that we're starting, some of the feedback from some of the payers, is the unspecified codes are there. But eventually, those unspecified codes will dissolve. They will go away. So one of the things we want to keep in mind as we're training physicians, as we're training staff, and everyone that will be impacted, you know, if we need to make some changes, let's make those changes on the specificity and making sure that we have everything exactly how it should be because you don't want to go back you know, to a physician and say, you can now use an unspecified code, but three months or six months when you know, CMS or Blue Cross or Aetna, if they start to eliminate those and then it becomes a documentation nightmare again to go back to the physician and say, well, you should have included this. So again, you know, you think through your specialty, your practice, the group you work with, the training you may have already started, implemented. But again, you know, building the code is also a great example to show, you know, the difference within that. So if we go to the nervous system. Cindy, if we go, we go to the nervous system, yes. can I interject something here? Yes, yes. To add, to add to what you've already said about the unspecified codes, I, I believe given the amount of time, expense, and resources that are involved with the implementation of I-10 and the fact that these new codes are going to have high level of specificity, I wouldn't be surprised if payers eventually do turn around at some point and start creating, adding, or changing their edits and, and or coding policies not to allow unspecified codes. 
Um, specific with laterality with the documentation of a fractured radius, you're going to know if it's on your left or right. So basically, they're forcing the providers to give that specific information that they should have. Absolutely. You know, so again, you know, just that importance you know, as Joe was stating, looking at your top codes, you know, and seeing, you know, where you will be impacted. And if we go to uh, slide 52, we're actually looking at chapter 6. This is diseases of the nervous system. So this list, um, you know, again, the categories and the volume that will fall under the nervous system. So many times, you know, within the specialties we're talking about, the nervous system and those codes can overlap, you know, into the other specialties. On our next slide, we're looking at an example of the Alzheimer's disease. So currently now with I-9, we have one code. But if we look now to I-10, Again, you know, you may very well recall, you know, a patient that you have, but if you went back and looked at that documentation, you know, the codes are being changed from your G30.0, saying, you know, Alzheimer's with an early onset. Is it the G30.1 because now it's with late onset? Is it other Alzheimer's disease? You know, again, we're talking about unspecified. You do see that there is a code here. They've allowed that. But again, you know, we really do not know, you know, how long the payers will allow that or when they will start to deny the claims. So again, you know, for a physician, this is the first time they've got test results back. It's an early onset or if it's just strictly, you know, they're seeing the patient. They don't really know when it happened. There are those very specific codes that they can choose from. Uh, so, you know, it does have some additional detail. As we move to the case example, again, we go to uh, slide 53. And this is actually showing, again, where we've highlighted the documentation. And this actually is showing, you know, again, our 77-year-old uh, woman comes in with the family. She has severe dementia. And, it's, and the physician states, due to the late onset of Alzheimer's disease, um, she's becoming you know, difficult to manage at home. We see here we've highlighted occasionally she is aggressive, physically strikes out against the family members. She's repeatedly wandered away from the home. You know, it requires intervention from the police to find her. So the family is refusing to admit the patient. Um, they do not want a long-term care facility. They want to continue to care for her at home if they can. So again, the physician's diagnosis is Alzheimer's dementia. It's also some of the behavioral disturbances, and specifically, it was the aggression and the wandering. If we go to our next slide, and we see that where we've taken this, and we again show you the columns of ICD-9 to the ICD-10, you can see we had Alzheimer's and dementia. We now go with this without the highlighted documentation. We're still at two codes, but we're, you know, again, it's unspecified. And then we have our dementia. But if we look at what was highlighted, because the physician did document the late onset with behavioral disturbances, so you're going to use that additional code to identify the dementia with the behavioral disturbances. So that allows you to be specific within the Alzheimer's. Then you are very specific within the dementia. You do not code, you know, like the S02.81 is the primary diagnosis code because that is the underlying condition. So again, you know, what is the primary and then what would be the underlying condition? When we move on to the muscle skeletal system, and then we look at our slide 58, and it shows us, you know, this is chapter 13. So also within the disease of the muscle skeletal system is the connective tissue. And that is in your M00 through M99. So it goes through, and you will see, you know, that we have um, listed out, you know, there's other joint disorders. There's the tissue disorders. There's disorders of the muscle. Then we have, you know, if we go under the M70 point M79, we get into other soft tissue disorders. We have, you know, the osteoporosis. So there's a wide variety when we're going into the, the muscle skeletal. If we look at our next slide and we're seeing, you know, there's several changes and expansions within the code. Again, very much what Joe was referencing, the laterality, the site. You're going to have very more 
specific information when you're looking at fractures and injuries. Your episodes of care play back in. You know, we've talked about that before, episodes of care, the initial, the follow-up sequel. Uh, there's the greater detail when you have to identify and report that diagnosis code. And then several chapters are being moved from various chapters in I-9, and they're being placed within, you know, a certain chapter within I-10. And one of those examples would be in gout. So again, you know, we want to look through, and we want to make sure that if you're looking through, you know, several of the codes being moved into various chapters, it's because, again, they reorganized. They've looked at being, you know, the more specificity. So again, you know, become familiar with what those are. On our next slide, as we've talked about the episode of care, this is, you know, across the board. It can be within different specialties. But again, you know, is it the initial encounter? In other words, it's used when the patient is receiving that active treatment for the injury. So emergency medicine and ortho, you're going to see a lot of codes that will be impacted by the episode of care differences. Then if it's with B, you know, this is our subsequent encounter. And this is actually used when your patient has received that active treatment for the injury, but they're continuing to receive routine care during that healing and recovery phase. So again, you know, you have to have that code. And then if it's our sequel, this is like your late effect code. So it could be that there's complications or conditions that can arise from that initial injury. So it could be, you know, a scar from a burn. So again, you know, as that patient is coming in, you know, keep in mind with your payers and how they're going to build their edits. You know, they're going to be looking at that and you don't want to have your claims, you know, be rejected or kicked out because they're going to know the first time that claim was submitted, you know, and then is this a follow-up? Is this still a ongoing, and it also, as we know, you know, if we look at our EODs and we look at edits, you know, how those edits will be built, how it will then, you know, be targeted back toward the diagnosis codes based on the visit. So again, you know, keeping the episode of care differences, I think this is one of the, the areas that physicians can immediately, if they're not already listing this, they can start today in their specialty to say it is the initial encounter. So there's many things they can start today that you know they would be in the habit so it would not be such an impact to them. And then if we go um, again to our case example, uh, which would be on slide 62, this would be our number three example. This actually is showing you know where the patient has presented to the office, they complain of muscle wasting of the lower legs. So they go through the examination, you know, again, we can see our documentation here, what the physician is recommending, the physical therapy. So we look at under our I-9, and this would be your 728.2, and then we have our 138, the late effects. And this, you know, this now includes under the 138 code, it includes your post-polio syndrome. When we look at I-10, we're going to see, again, we're building our code because our code that we're looking at, it shows under the, the muscle wasting, it's not elsewhere classified, but it's the right lower leg because we were up, you know, again, it's saying the lower leg. Where did this occur? And then we can say it's the left lower leg because it was up documented, the patient presented it was in both lower legs. So we need to make sure, again, you know, we're showing the right and the left. And then we can still have the post polio syndrome to code that as well. So again, you know, as we go through and, you know, there's numerous case examples that we can go through. And again, it continues to show, again, looking at the laterality, looking at uh, site specific, looking at what the conditions may be, what the late effects may be. So again, you know, what is that current process improvement you may have in your office or your facility? and where will you need to be in order to meet the criteria of what, you know, the I-10 coding will be impacting and bringing, you know, to your office or your facility. On our next slide, we wanted to include, uh, this is more of, um, well, I apologize, we're going to do a poll question, so please participate within our poll question at this time. <laughs> 
And as we as we go to just a additional a few a couple additional case examples, and this is more of just a kind of a refresher of you know some things that we've gone over before. But if we're looking at you know a primary care preventative diagnosis about you know your 22 year old female comes in for the preventative, she's doing well, no complaints, she's had normal immunizations, return is needed, next scheduled visit. So you can see here, you know, you want to go through that process of looking in the index. It is an examination for an adult. And then your diagnosis code, it falls in the Z category because it was that encounter for the routine adult health exam with no abnormal findings. Our next case example that we see a lot of can be depression. So, you know, you want to kind of forget about that catch-all of what we see now under the 311 and we know how payers look at that. But at a minimum, if there is depression that's being documented, then you need to identify, again, it's going to go back to the episode. Is it a single episode, reoccurrence? Look in your index under the F, and you're going to start to build that code, you know, F32. And then what would your additional code be, whether it be single episode or reoccurrence? And then there are choices. You know, is the depression of a mild, moderate, severe? Is it with psychotic? in remission. So again, you know, do you know where this falls? And many times, you know, I see, you know, every day just depression. So again, you know, we know how payers look at that today, but we, you know, I I feel very confident that their edits will be built to be very specific now, you know, just about this one code. So you know, just some things to remember. Um, if we go to our reminders and tips, you know, I do want to kind of go through on um, slide 68. Um, and we have had some questions from some of our uh, past webinars that we have done. But per the Rule 837, basically this is where you can build four diagnosis codes per procedure line item. But one of the things to remember is that you know you need to check with your local vendors regarding the number of diagnosis codes they accept. And also keep in mind, you know, as we're talking about our non-specific codes, they are available. But try to see if you can go into the more specific code because payers will continue to update their edits. You know, that's something we don't know until we actually start to see that occur within our individual you know, practices. Some of the educational tips, you know, as for coders, you know, is to evaluate current encounter forms. So if you are still dealing with um, the paper encounter form, you know, start to look at that. If you're on an EHR, look at, you know, your favorites list. What will be the impact under the physician's favorite list today as they move to I-10? You know, look at your specialty societies. You know, that are related to ICD-10, learn about crosswalks, you know, what is available in the crosswalk that will be pertinent and acceptable to your specialty. And then, you know, again, you know, we talked about the anatomy, you know, make sure that, you know, if it's to understand uh, specific areas with that, that, you know, you do some refresher courses on that. On our next slide, when we talk about, you know, for the providers, again, you know, it's almost repetitive and it can sound redundant. And I had one physician tell me uh, last week it was like a broken record. You know, I don't want to hear I-10. But I think we have to, you know, realize we do have to move forward. We have to keep, you know, I think in mind that our physicians still have to treat their patients, see their patients. We want to bill out the revenue. But again, you know, continue to work. You that, you know, if you are a provider on the, you know, on the call, you know, you know immediately maybe, you know, where you feel you need education, but if you're coders, um, you know, if you're able to talk to your doctors, hopefully have um, two-way communication or with your clients, and to say, you know, what do we need to do? Where are we between the change? Because again, you know, 15 months can sound like a long period of time, but what's your plan over the next 15 months? You know, uh, continue to look at some of the documentation. You know, you're doing some internal audits or if you're having someone do external audits, seeing where, you know, where are you falling within, if this was, would you pass under the ITM? Evaluate your uh, EHRs, you know, see what's in there, what codes you have how your new codes are going to be listed. And then again, you know, I, you know, I can't stress enough that two-way communication, whether it's between physicians, administrators, coders, um, you know, 
that practice, you know the offices you work at, you know, what will be that smooth transition for you. So again, you know, that is some of our, our tips that, you know, we like to just continue to remind. On the next slide, your resources, you know, continue to watch for additional educational training throughout the year. You know, everyone's involved. You know, who is involved? What can they bring to the table? You know, ask the questions. Uh, you know, to me, we should all be asking questions. You know, who are your resources? Who can you network with? Who can you work with? Uh, you know, one of the things to remember, you know, with everything that is coming up, you know, within ICD-10 is, um, you know, to stay tuned. We will actually be, you know, continuing check back, you know, on our website. We'll be continuing, you know, to have continued education. Uh, we're going to have a fall webinar, and at that we're going to look more at the revenue focus as how it relates to ICD-10. And then with your questions, you know, that is very important, I think, to myself, to Joe, to others on the team, because we need to hear your feedback of what is helpful for you, you know, beneficial for you, so that, uh, you know, these are high level. It's, uh, there's no way in one hour we could train you on everything in your specialty, but we hope, you know, it's bringing to the table at a high level, the impact and the information so it can help you start to prepare and you know, take the steps for that. So I'm going to, at this point, uh, we will have questions. Um, also remember for any of you on our last slide, and you will actually have the link to receive the 1AAPC CEU. And those CEU certificates will be emailed to the address you provided when you registered for the webinar. So you want to make sure we have that. But um, you know, I thank you um, on behalf of uh, Joe and I, McKesson, and we would I would like to now turn that back over to Nicole for anyone that may have questions. Great, thanks, Cindy and Joe. Um, just to let the whole audience know, we will be sending out a recorded copy of this webinar next week. We've gotten a couple questions on that, so um, you can expect that in your email as a follow-up next week. And I'll go to the first question. When are the episode of care, seventh character extensions primarily used? Okay. Um, the episode of care, your seventh character, those are used primarily with your injuries, your poisoning, and other consequences of external causes. Uh, there are three seventh character extensions, and for most of these conditions, except with the exception of your fractures, so again, that would go back to our initial encounter, the subsequent, or if it's a sequel encounter. Great, thank you. Uh, and then the next one, will all injuries be grouped by the type of injury? I can take this one, Cindy, if you don't okay. mind. Uh, no, unlike I-9, this is where there's going to be a change with I-10. In I-10, the injuries are going to be grouped by the anatomical sites and not grouped by the type of injury. Okay, great. Uh, the next one, if ED physician provides initial encounter for a fracture and refers patient to an orthopod for follow-up, would the first visit with the orthopod be considered initial or subsequent? It would be considered initial because it's still during the treatment phase. Initial would be routine follow-up during the healing process. Okay. So you can have an initial counter for the ED doc, and you have the initial for the secondary physician, depending on what their doing for that patient at that time. If they're treating the injury, it's going to be the initial. Okay, thank you. Um, the next one, and we are near the top of the hour, so we'll probably take one or maybe two more, and okay. then um, we will follow up with any other questions after the webinar today. Uh, will claims be denied for not using ICD-10 code in, 2000, in October of 2014? Well, the effective date is October 1, 2014, and so if I understood the question, if you're not using the I-10 code, will the claim be denied? The payers, as of you know, today and the information we're receiving, they're saying they will be ready. So yes, if the date of service is October 1, 2014, you need to submit the I-10 code. 
Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and that does bring us to 3 o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and hold off on any additional questions. If you do have them, though, feel free to email them to us uh, after this webinar, and we'll follow up directly. And do remember to go to the link we will be sending out so that um, you can receive your CEU credit. Thank you, Joe and Cindy, for today's presentation.